Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 112. We're talking about Halim, the creamy wheat and meat Persian porridge today. It's our favorite thing to do with leftovers from Thanksgiving, specifically with the turkey meat. And we're here with one of our experts, my co-host and partner, Vita. Hi, Vita Jun. Hi, Vita Jun. Thank you for the kind words. Yeah, I'm a big fan of Halim. You know, the funny thing is I actually wasn't always a big fan of it. And even now I love it, but I actually eat it in small quantities. When I have like a huge bowl of it, it could just be a little bit kind of like overwhelming because it can be kind of heavy sometimes. I have like a version that I do that is not as heavy that we'll kind of get into in a minute, but it could be very, very rich. And then Halim, this beautiful beautiful, you know, porridge, as we're kind of calling it, is garnished on top and is really part of the whole experience is melted butter and cinnamon and sugar kind of sprinkled all on top of it. And you can sometimes have some bread that you can kind of like dip into it and have it like soak up all the butter and stuff. But it is a like a super delicious, sweet and savory like kind of porridge bowl of really delicious goodness Just that a lot of people have for, you know, traditionally served for breakfast. Yeah. And I'm glad you shared that you didn't always love it because that is the case with me. I am only recently starting to eat Halim and I'm also learning how to make it. So today we're going to teach you a few different versions. We're definitely here. Beats Beats Eats recipe. And I can share how my mother-in-law makes it and then a version that I buy from the market. But I'm learning that there are a lot of variations for how you can make it as is the case with most Persian recipes. It depends on the family and the region. Yeah. Bita Jun, could you tell us a little bit about the traditional way to make it? Sure. As I've been learning, and again, I've mostly been an eater, but this year I'm learning to make it. The traditional way, it always starts with a form of meat and wheat. So the meat, depending on the region and the family, could really be any meat, such as like lamb, beef, chicken, turkey, and it is made from wheat in different forms. So some people use the whole grains and soak them overnight, cook them, and then sort of like mash and strain the outer shell. They sort of strain the husk or the the wheat bran layer. If you have access to it, it's nice to be able to use like a pearled wheat or barley. The pearled wheat or barley is a little bit easier to cook down and then mash and blend into really creamy, delicious halim. So yeah, you cook the meat and most people cook the meat with some onion and salt and you cook down the wheat and then it's a process of basically just mashing it. And from my understanding, it really is like a custard. When I eat a super creamy halim, it tastes like custard to me. And that is because a lot of times people will actually cook it down with the butter and milk and a little bit of sugar. Oh. Yeah. Then you just kind of like set it and garnish it with cinnamon. And that's sort of like the traditional way that I've seen it. But why don't you tell us about your quick and easy bastardized version? You've called it that in our other previous episodes. I know. I do call it a bastardized version as I do with some of my other like recipes that I take a bunch of shortcuts on, but I still try to keep the integrity of the dish just because I'm, you know, running around a lot and I just really want to have those flavors and I want to expose my family to them and stuff. So my recipes may not always be super authentic, but I do love making this halim and we call it porridge at the house, which my husband doesn't always love that reference to it. It makes him kind of like think of some food that you would not necessarily want to have, but it is a super delicious dish and my kids like it. And so what I actually do is I use oatmeal. So my recipe is like super easy. And it's a great way to kind of like have carbs and have protein all in one like kind of dish. And it's like really warming with the cinnamon. So I actually will use rotisserie chicken, to be honest with you. I will use like already cooked chicken in my version. I'll use a broth. I love making broth. A lot of times, actually, like I will just use the bones from like a roasted chicken or or if not, just a store-bought version is fine. You can get some like really nice bone broth right now from even like your local supermarkets will have really great quality ones. And I basically will cook the oats in broth. 
And after it's kind of like cooked a bunch, I will add the rotisserie chicken to it and let it all kind of like cook together and just like melt together and just be chill. And then I'll run in a hand immersion blender, or you could, if you don't have one, you could just use your regular blender or even like a potato masher and kind of get it all mashed together. Actually, I'll put chia seeds in it sometimes if I want to have like the nutritional value of chia seeds in there for like, you know, all the omegas in there and the additional protein, I will add chia seeds and that's it. I love it. You can actually kind of like freeze them in smaller portions and if you want to like kind of be meal planning. But I love that just because it's like super easy to just use the already cooked rotisserie chicken. Oats and oatmeal is something that we always have around at the house. And you can like garnish it with like cinnamon or a little bit of like sugar and melted butter if you want to go the traditional way. And personally, one of my favorite ways of having halim, and now I always love to have this, is actually with cranberry sauce. I get a lovely cranberry sauce every year that's just cranberries and sugar and it's like really natural and really delicious and I always have it. I buy extra every Thanksgiving season. I buy extra so that I have it throughout the year and I love to put a big fat dollop of the cranberry sauce jam essentially of cranberry onto a big super cozy bowl of the halim and I love having that with like the extra like tart flavor as a little burst of citrus and sourness. That sounds so delicious. And to keep the Thanksgiving flavors going, that makes me think of how my husband has been eating it lately because it's one of his most favorite foods. As I mentioned in our previous episode, my mother-in-law, MJ, makes a whole extra turkey to do things with the leftovers. And one of the things is to make a huge batch of halim. And recently we went over to in Orange County Mission Ranch, and we were able to buy some that they make there. They make a really, really creamy custardy version that's ever so lightly sweetened. It doesn't have too much meat. And let me tell you, I got sold on it after tasting that version. And I'm inspired to try to make like a very like a copycat of that one. I really liked it. But what I was going to say is that First of all, he moans when he eats it. Oh, God. (laughs) I caught him, like, literally, like, making sound effects as he's eating it. And the other thing is that he was eating it, like, as an appetizer to dinner. He couldn't even wait to have it for breakfast. Oh, gosh, yeah. I can imagine. It's definitely a fan favorite. Now, there are some ways to lighten it up. It is a super healthy food. It's whole you know what I mean? Like whole ingredients and not too many, you know, like simple ingredients. It's primarily made, you know, with a lean meat and an ancient grain, which is like a complex carb or a, you know, like a healthy carb. Yeah. And then the parts of it that make it high fat, you can make a modernized version. You know, maybe you use a vegan butter. There's a brand of vegan butter that I really like lately. You could use a lower fat milk. And you could just lighten up the proportion of sugar. And that way you could still have a lot of the same flavors, put the cinnamon on top while, you know, really turn it into quite a nutritious and healthy breakfast or snack or appetizer to your dinner. Yeah. My version, actually, I don't even use any milk in it. Oh. And I don't I've actually even put butter in it to cook it. I just have it as a garnish at the end. Yeah. So, hey, B, did you, do you know about of different types of wheat that could be used? Or what if I can't find wheat kernels or pearled barley? Like you said you use oatmeal, but is there a certain type of oatmeal that you use? Oatmeal is a fine alternative, right? Yeah, oatmeal actually works great. And I've actually made it with like a bunch of different kinds of oatmeal. I've used, if I want to just make a really quick and easy version, I just use like rolled oats. And then I've also used like steel cut oats too. The steel cut oats, it does definitely take a lot longer to cook. And then for that, I definitely feel like if you really want to get kind of like the real halim experience, you definitely do want to make sure you run like an immersion blender through it or put it in the blender because it really helps it get like really soft and really creamy. So you definitely need that with the steel cut oats. But yeah, you tell me what other grains can we use? Well, those are pretty much all the ones I know. If we talk about the equipment, and that might also have something to do with with the type of grain that you use. Mm -hmm. My mother in law, MJ has walked me through her delicious recipe, and she uses steel cut oats. She uses a slow cooker. Oh, yes. And I was just teaching her that Instant Pots actually have like a slow cook feature as well. Uh Uh-huh. That's right. So you could use an Instant Pot, a pressure cooker, a slow cooker. But 
definitely would require some extra cooking time and, and the immersion process to get the creamy because steel cut oats have the husk or outer layer. So the consistency is harder and crunchier <laughs> for lack of a better way to describe it. Exactly. If you're thinking of like the classic hadim feel, mouth feel, then it definitely does have that creamy. But I would say that even like, mm -hmm. you know, if you did want to just do another, you know, hadim inspired recipe and you wanted to keep the oats like more whole, mm -hmm. that's totally a great option too. However way you want to eat it. Yeah. And definitely a super nutritious way to use the steel cut. Those are really good for you too. Yeah. Good point. And then I know like other ways to eat it in, I believe in Esfahan, when they serve halim, they pair it with adasi or like a lentil soup as well. Oh, interesting. A little mix of both in their bowl. And it's like a classic combination that I'm not sure if it has it in other regions as well, but definitely in Isfahan they do. Yeah. So I would check like the sort of the specialty markets. And, you know, around here we have some sort of specialty produce markets that sometimes has those type of grains. Uh -huh. And also Amazon, I'm going to check. So another word for pearled wheat or pearl barley, sometimes another word for it is pelted. Oh, And I think what that means is there's no outer layer of the bran on the on the grain. So oh, okay, that'll be the creamiest and easiest version if you could find it that way. Cool. Awesome. Well, great. Well, I hope that everyone has had a really great Thanksgiving and we are excited about some of the winter holidays that are coming up next month. We're getting ready for Yalda. We have some special guests in the queue and also the great end of year holidays, Christmas, Hanukkah, all that good stuff. Well, today we have an Ask the Beats that we are so excited about. It's an audio recording, a voice recording of Instagram's DM feature. Hello, my name is Anna, and I love listening to your podcast, Modern Persian Food. I'm actually Mexican, and I am so interested in fusion food, and I would like to know if you know of any recipe or recipes that could be a great fusion between Mexican and Iranian food. Thank you. Again, this is Anna from Anna's Heavenly Tacos. Great. So fun. Thanks for your question, Anna. Immediately, I am reminded of our episode that we did with Savage Taste, Savage Muse, Parisa Parnian, and her spice mix, Parexiakin, where it blends Persian and Mexican flavors together in this really awesome spice blend. Yes, Perksican. Yes. Parisa's Perksican. Yes. So that's a great place to start for anyone who doesn't have, you know, all of the different herbs and spices. It's a really great, easy solution to kind of get the fusion flavors together. Can we talk about Fesinjun like, again? Because I love Fesinjun and it's such a like winter holiday. But immediately when I think of like Mexican food and Persian food, the hybrid of some sort of Fesinjun slash mole sounds really interesting to me. Bonle is like this like kind of dark, chili, chocolatey sauce, really. And Fesenjun, it kind of looks very similar with like the dark brown. Fesenjun is, you know, made with like ground up walnuts and pomegranate molasses. So if there was like some sort of blend, like a Fesenjun mole, I think that that would be awesome. So think of like Fesenjun, but like with like a bunch of like chilies in there. That sounds really good. Immediately, that's what, what comes to mind for me. All good points. Yeah, we will link to the episode where we talked to Parisa Parnian and how to get Perksican. That whole episode, I think, has a lot of good tips of how to blend the cuisine. Yeah. Paris is an expert of that. For me, I think of foods that are already kind of crossover between the two cuisines. The first one that came to my mind was corn. Mm, mm -hmm, I'm realizing mm -hmm. how much I love corn as an ingredient. I'm a little obsessed with anything with corn. But of course, there's Mexican street corn. And in Persian cuisine, I call it Persian street corn. That's the version that's kind of burned to a char, or not really burned, but like really char grilled and then soaked in a salt water. Mm -hmm. You can absolutely play with blending and adding some Mexican spices to Persian corn. That would be so delicious. And I've done it. Mm -hmm. That sounds really good. I'm getting so hungry. Like my mouth is literally like watering as I'm talking right now. But the other one that came to mind is Spanish rice. So we have a rice that has always reminded me of Spanish rice when I make it. And that's Estambali Polo. 
Estambuli polo is a Persian tomato rice that some people make with just tomatoes and rice. Other people also include potatoes. But other than, you know, kind of like the spices that we use, the main ingredients are the same. In the Persian version, it's the Persian iconic spices of turmeric and saffron and onion. In Spanish rice, it might be more Spanish and Mexican spices of garlic and cumin, but you can absolutely fuse those together. The other thing to me is to just go ahead and introduce some other sides or ingredients that are common to Mexican cuisine with your Persian dish. So for example, if you're going to be making Estamboli polo, you can serve that with some fresh herbs and some avocado and lime juice. Oh, that sounds so good. And maybe some seafood or shrimp. Yes. And have a Persian Mexican fusion. So those are the things that came to mind for me. We do have warming spices in the same way that Mexican cuisine has warming spices. Some crossover spices include cinnamon and garlic. I use a lot more garlic than I think a lot of people do in their Persian food. But we, in our Advia, some of the spices do cross over Advia as the Persian spice blend with a lot of Mexican spices naturally. What if there is a fusion of, get this, juja kebab tacos? Okay, I'm in. Right? And so <laughs> juja kebab is typically like a chicken that is marinated in like a saffron, lemon juice mixture, sometimes with yogurt, sometimes without yogurt, depending on what recipe you want to use, but kind of that kind of like lemon citrusy chicken in a taco. And maybe you garnish that with like a salachirazi salsa. Oh, yeah. So, you know, salachirazi is tomato, cucumber, onion mixed in like a lemony dressing. So what if you do that kind of like as a salsa on top of the juja kebab taco? This is feeling like it could be a whole episode because now I'm just reminded that I did over 4th of July make salachirazi with some Mexican elements in a more salsa fresca style. And it's really easy to add avocado to your salad shirazi. Yep. And it already is really citrusy with the lime juice. And thank you for inspiring us because I think we're on a roll now and we could go on and on. Totally. Yeah. With the chicken tacos or you can make fish tacos and have it with like that salad shirazi salsa. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I had made fish tacos that day. Yeah. I have one more idea too. What if we wanted to just like riff (laughs) off of it a little bit more if we're talking about tacos and maybe some sort of kebabs. What if you do like a kebab, kebab kubide type of taco with like a birria. So do you know what birria is? It's like a consomme, basically like brothy soup that you dip your quesadilla or your taco or whatever into the birria, like consomme soup, and then stuff it in your mouth and take a big fat bite of it. But maybe you have that with like type of like a kebab type of fusion. Yeah. And then, you know, we do have crossovers with herbs. Yes. Cilantro. So thank you, Anna. You really got our juices flowing. I'm super hungry now. We're going to probably have a future episode about the fusion possibilities, but this was really fun. Appreciate your Ask the Beats. Keep them coming. Send them to us. We love fresh voices and ideas. Yes. I hope we inspired you to make Halim. And if you do, let us know. Shoot us an email share on social media, and thank you. Great, thank you. Till next time, bye. You've been listening to the Modern Persian Food Podcast with Bita and Bita. Thanks for spending time with us. If you've enjoyed what you heard today, consider telling a friend or giving us a good rating. You can subscribe to our show for free on your favorite podcasting app or find us online at modernpersianfood.com or on Instagram for the recipes and information we talked about today. We'd love to hear your thoughts and see you next time.